Hi, my name is Stuart and it's my privilege to be the minister here at St Ninian's Church in Stonehouse and to welcome you to our time together as we join wherever we are and however we come together, whether that be on YouTube and Facebook, on our website, our podcast or even by telephone. Today I'm in our church building and I'm glad to be able to welcome you all. Some of you will know this place very well and others perhaps have never been here before. As always, I hope you find our time together fruitful and I'm glad of your company. We continue our journey with Matthew's Gospel, following straight on from last week's reading. And today, Yvonne reads for us. We read from Matthew, chapter 21, verses 33 to 46. Listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard, put a fence around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he leased it to tenants and went to another country. When the harvest time had come, he sent his slaves to the tenants to collect his produce. But the tenants seized his slaves and beat one, killed another, and stoned another. Again he sent other slaves, more than the first, and they treated them in the same way. Finally he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and get his inheritance. So they seized him, threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? They said to him, He will put those wretches to a miserable death and lease the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the produce at the harvest time. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people that produces the fruits of the kingdom. The one who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, and it will crush anyone on whom it falls. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, They realised that he was speaking about them. They wanted to arrest him, but they feared the crowds because they regarded him as a prophet. This is a brutal story. Any illusion about some kind of warm and fluffy Jesus should finally be shattered by this parable. This comes straight after the passage we read last week where Jesus evades a trap question set by the religious leaders about where his authority comes from. Jesus turns their trap back on them with a question about John the Baptist's authority. And then Jesus tells a parable about a vineyard and two sons. One who says no when his father asks him to go and work in the vineyard, but then changes his mind. And the second son who says he will work, but doesn't. And the religious leaders realise that the story is about them. They have the chance to do the right thing, but still won't change, even when presented with all the evidence that they need. Jesus doesn't leave it there, though. He doubles down and tells them another story about a vineyard. This time, the story isn't saying one thing and doing another. This is something else entirely. The landowner rents out his vineyard to some tenants, and it's a great property. The landowner not only plants the vines, but builds a fence and a watchtower and even digs out a wine press. Everything the tenants need for them is there. All they have to do is tend the vines and harvest the grapes and press them. When the harvest is ready, the landowner sends three slaves to collect the produce. And that should have been the end of it. But it isn't. Not by a long way. What happens next is awful. It's violent and it's shocking and it, it has massive consequences for everyone, even the tenants. We humans seem to have an amazing ability to press the self-destruct button, even when things are going well. We look back in history and our past is littered with people and nations just like these tenants. People who have all they need but want more. The story is so hardwired into us that the very first choice that humans make in the Garden of Eden in the Genesis story is to want more, to know more, to be more like God. And the consequences of that choice is perhaps to be doomed to make the same mistake over and over and over again. Jesus is talking to the religious leaders. He's calling them out for their failure to lead well. In fact, much more than that. The parable lays out the crimes of the nation. The slaves are the prophets, the men and women who spoke truth to power, who told the authorities exactly what the consequences of their failure to follow God would lead to. It started with Amos. 
He was telling truth to power nearly 800 years before Jesus is doing the same thing. Amos tells us that God says, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I'll not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Leadership is vital, especially in times like these. I wonder how we think our leaders would stand up to this kind of inspection. Are they good? Are they just, honest, merciful? I wonder if we want them to be. We heard in the last two weeks of how the religious leaders were afraid of the crowd. They know that the people could rise up together at any point and get rid of the people who rule over them. The leaders are just like every leader. They rule by consent, the consent of the people. So it's of course easy to criticise leaders, especially when they have fallen into a kind of tribalism, where those that we support from different parties or different ideas of the future are somehow different or ill-informed or just plain stupid. There's a saying that we get exactly the kind of leaders we deserve. Just as people in Jesus' time allowed those in power to continue to rule over them in ways that were damaging and unjust and self-serving, we can be just as guilty of doing the same things at all kinds of level. That can be as simple as never challenging anything the minister says because we think they have some kind of status or authority that puts us beyond reproach. Or thinking that the only time you need to think about your elected representatives is every four years when we vote, even if we bother to do that. The rest of the time we can sit back and moan or cheer or just forget about the whole thing. It always astonishes me when people say that faith and politics shouldn't mix. If we're supposed to be about the things Jesus says we are, like justice and the plight of the poor and the marginalised and the oppressed, then the political arena is where those decisions are made. As an institution, the church shouldn't be about supporting political parties, but it should absolutely engage in the political process to hold our leaders to account and to speak for those whose voice is so often never heard. When we do this well, huge change for good can occur. But there have been far too many times when the church as an institution has been on the wrong side of history. This very passage has been used to promote anti-Semitism in the past. The vineyard is Israel, the landowner is God and the tenants are the Jews. The slaves sent to collect the produce are the prophets. The son is Jesus and the Jews kill him. So Christians blame the Jews. And to read this parable in this way is to completely misinterpret and willfully misunderstand it. Jesus isn't talking to the whole nation. He's talking to a small group of very powerful people who, as it happens, are terrified of their own citizens. But that's so often what we do, isn't it? We willfully misinterpret to suit our own agenda or our own point of view. We surround ourselves with what sociologists and researchers would call bias confirmation. We only read things that we agree with. Social media sends us articles that we like and so further confirm our point of view. We quickly only hear from people who think like us and from there it's a pretty short hop to take an entrenched positions where others, whoever they are, are wrong or dangerous or part of a huge conspiracy. Leadership starts with us. It starts with us taking seriously the job of doing the hard work of being properly informed. In a church context, that means taking seriously our work of studying scripture, of learning together, of spending time in prayer and working out what God is asking for us in our time and in our place. In the wider world, that means not just accepting whatever your pal says in Facebook is fact. The accusations Jesus make in this parable is that the leaders have failed to take that work seriously because if they had, then their decisions would be different. But it also follows that that accusation applies to those who consent to that leadership, who've also failed in this work, and in that failure have allowed and sometimes encouraged and enable our leaders to create policies that don't live up to the standards that Jesus sets for us. We are each given our own vineyards to tend, our own areas of responsibility, our own fruit to grow and harvest. But it's not about us. We repeat that to ourselves, it's not about us. We cleverly distance ourselves from all those unfortunate targets of Jesus' scathing condemnation. It's not about us. It's about them. We're just over here quietly doing the best that we can, learning from the failings of others 
while God sighs and remarks, they're at it again. Distancing themselves from my teaching, removing themselves from its implications. If only they could see it's so about them. As willful now as any generation before, as righteous and smug and well-meaning and downright cruel, it's so about us. A lack of compassion. We cling tightly to all that we have, taunting others with our wealth, consigning our children to rubbish heaps. It's so about us. If we could only wake up and hear God's challenge to to effect change by letting go of some of the things that we hold so tightly to, by giving up control, by working for justice, by having compassion, by following Jesus, by acknowledging the vulnerable God that, that is in all things, in all places, where God's children suffer. And follow our God out of sanctuaries like these, into the streets where God is to be found weeping too.
never, never fail through all eternity. If we were here in person at some point during the service, uh, we would bring our offering. I would hold this great big plate and people would bring forward money as a symbol of our fruitfulness and all the other gifts and skills and talents that we bring to the building of the kingdom. So I wanted to take time to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who have continued to use those gifts, sometimes in new and very challenging circumstances. And those of you who have made financial contributions through standing orders or handing in a cheque or an envelope or through donations on our website. Your support helps us to help our community to minister here in Stonehouse and in the wider church. So we pray to dedicate you and your gifts. Lord, we are tenants of your vineyard, guests at your table, children in your household. Transform our pride with your prophetic presence. Subvert our expectations with your abiding grace so that we might work for your purposes and live for your kingdom. Take all that we have and all that we are and align them with your good intentions in your name we pray. O planet weaver, the skies declare your glory. O star spinner, the vault of heaven proclaims your handiwork. Day to day pours forth speech, night to night declares knowledge. Yet there are no words, their voices cannot be heard. But creation's pure sound reverberates throughout the cosmos. For in the heavens you have set a tent for the sun, and on earth a place for us all. Yet we often forget that we are creations of your breath, tenants of your vineyard. We silence your voice, we subjugate your land, we mar your image within and around, we reject the cornerstone and kill your son. Yet you do not shy away, you meet our hate with love, our violence with steadfast loving kindness, our forgetfulness with remembrance. Remind us this day and this night that we can kill your love, but we cannot keep it dead and buried. Redeem us each day and each night that we might live in tune with the words of your Son, with the reverberations of your cosmos, thus enabling the words of our mouths and the meditation of all our hearts to be acceptable to you. If all our accomplishments, all our acumen, all our wisdom, our work, our will were to be stripped away, we still belong to you, O God. Therefore we press onwards towards the goal, not to earn your grace, but to share your love. So we pray for the twisting of our priorities, for the confusion of our belonging, and for the marring of your image. We are your children. We are your tenants. We are made in your image. May we live up to that reality in our actions and thoughts. We pray that those in power may seek service above celebrity and work to uplift the poor rather than their popularity. We pray that those without power might find strength in you and partners in us, even when we feel powerless. We pray for the courage and strength to press onward. We pray for humility and compassion to transcend the past and press forward to what lies ahead. For you are our beginning. You are our present. You are our destination. Amen. As one of God's children, you are not cast aside. God loves you and cherishes you. You belong. You are treasured. So take this affirmation and live into this week. May you feel God's love, Christ's inclusion and the Spirit's presence as you go. This day, this week and always. May the Lord bless you. Thank you.